We are continuing our study on the book of Luke called A Historical Study on the Book of Luke. This is teaching number 34. And we're still discussing Jerusalem's redemption. This is part 11 of Jerusalem's redemption. It's also part three of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And as far as Jerusalem's redemption goes, it, it comes out of Luke 2.38 with Anna, Luke 21.28 with Jesus, Luke 24.21 with the two men on the road to Emmaus, all referencing Jerusalem's redemption. But to really understand Jerusalem's redemption, we had to go back into the Jewish scriptures. We had to, to really dive very deeply into some background information, which led us to Daniel chapter 2, where we looked at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We look at the statue, the stone, and the kingdom of God. And by the way, about two weeks ago, I started writing another book called Nebuchadnezzar's Dream, the statue, the stone, and the kingdom of grace. And so I'm really excited about uh, finishing that book here, maybe by October or November, and getting that out uh, to people. I think it's really neat to see uh, the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's statue and or Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the meaning of the statue, the stone, and, and the kingdom of God. Um, it's really exciting to see. But we needed that information to understand the redemption of Jerusalem. In our previous study over the, the past two weeks and then tonight, we've been examining the 70 weeks of Daniel or the 490 years in Daniel 9 verse 24. So in the 70 years of Daniel, in this 490 years, this 490 year period of time that was marked off by God, it was for the people of Israel and it was for the city of Jerusalem. And what we talked about, and we're going to see more of this as we progress through the 70 weeks of Daniel, is that the, the final seven years of the 490 years would bring the Old Testament of law to an end, and the New Testament of grace would begin. And again, these 490 years are contained in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and the verses that follow that. But let's read Daniel 9, 24. It says, 70 weeks are decreed on your people, that's the Jewish people of, under the Old Testament of law, and your holy city, that's the city of Jerusalem, Old Covenant Jerusalem, to finish disobedience, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, some versions say the most holy place. The word place is not in the Hebrew language there or in the Hebrew manuscripts. It's to anoint the most holy, and it's referring to in its context to reveal the Messiah or the Christ or the anointed one, the Messiah, the word anoint there is the word for Messiah, to reveal the Messiah to Israel. And we're going to look at that next week when we talk about what it means to anoint the most holy. But what we do see in the 70 years or the 70 weeks, <clears throat> meaning 490 years, and we looked at that last week, uh, is, is these 490 years ultimately point to Jesus when he would establish the New Testament in his blood. It's Matthew 26, 28, Luke 22, 20. And then the Old Testament of law would ultimately come to an end. Jesus would establish the New Testament of grace and the Old Testament of law would come to an end. Now, during these 490 years, there would be six actions. We see these six actions in Daniel 9, 24. And we looked at two of these actions in our previous study. Action number one was to finish disobedience. Action number two was to make an end of sins. So in this study, we're going to pick up with action number three, which is make reconciliation for iniquity or to remove the barrier of sin between God and people. We see iniquity in Isaiah 53, 6, the word iniquity. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. 
we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, in its immediate context, it's talking about the, the Jewish people, but in its wider meaning, we know that the sins of, of humanity were laid upon Jesus. So the word iniquity simply means the sins of all people has been laid upon Jesus. So what we see in action number three is make reconciliation for iniquity. So we see iniquity is are the sins of the world have been laid upon Jesus. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, and we're going to look at the word reconciliation and the word uh, sin. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, this is out of the Berean Standard Bible. It reads this way, the old has passed away. Now, in the context, the old here is the old covenant of law. Paul began speaking about the old covenant or the old testament of law in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He's continued his thought all the way through 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. So the old here is not referring to, as it's taught so commonly, the old way I used to live or the old identity in Adam. That, that's not the context at all. The context is the old covenant or the Old Testament of law, the ministry of death in 2 Corinthians 3, has passed away now that Christ has brought reconciliation through his death. Says the old covenant of law has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, the, the, the new here is the new covenant of grace or the new testament of grace. And again, covenant and testament, regardless of whether we use old covenant or old testament or new covenant or new testament, the, the Greek word is diatheke. Some translations will use covenant, others will use testament. But the Greek word is the atheke. And what's important to understand is a new way of relating to God has come through the death of Jesus. So the Old Covenant and the New Test oh, New Covenant is a new way of relating to God, and Old Testament or, or the Old Testament and the New Testament, new way of relating to God. And the Old Testament and New Testament are not talking about books. And I know I say that a lot, but it's important that we understand it, and somebody might be listening to this video and has not heard me speak about that before, or listening on a podcast. When the Bible uses the word Old Testament, it's talking about the law of Moses that began in Exodus chapter 24, verse 28, and was in effect until Christ died on the cross, and the sacrifices under the Old Covenant of Law ceased when Jesus died on the cross, because his death was the final sacrifice for sins. So the context of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 is about the new that has come. And the new that has come is the New Testament of grace that went into effect when Jesus died on the cross. So the Old Testament of law has passed away, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Behold, the New Testament of grace has come. And Paul's spoken or written about that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he refers to the Old Covenant or the Old Testament of law as a ministry of death that was written on stone. He's talking about the Ten Commandments there. That's a ministry of death. Behold, the New Testament of grace has come, and he's talking about the ministry of life, the ministry of the Spirit, where the Spirit of God takes the truths of the new covenant and helps people understand what Christ did at the cross um, for us, where he took all of our sinfulness at the cross and he offers us all of his righteousness, which is a gift of grace that we receive by faith. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 is explaining. So let's read this again. The Old Testament of law has passed away. Behold, the New Testament of grace has come. Or, the old way of relating to God under the law of Moses is done, and the new way of relating to God under the grace of our Lord Jesus, established at the cross, has come. All this is from God. All what is from God? 
the new covenant of grace is from God. Uh, God prophesied about it in, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The Old Testament law passing away is from God. And the reason Paul makes the statement, all this is from God, is he wanted people to know this isn't his idea. He's not making this up that the old covenant of law is gone, that the old covenant of law is a ministry of death, that the Ten Commandments is a ministry of death, and the new covenant of grace is a ministry of eternal life, eternal forgiveness, eternal righteousness. He's telling people that he's writing to because they're having a really difficult time believing his message. And so he's communicating to them that this message that I'm communicating about Jesus establishing the New Testament of grace in his blood is not from me. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that God has made us, his ministry team, competent as teachers of the New Covenant or the New Testament. And so he's wanting people to understand he's not making up his message. His message isn't, this message isn't from him. It's directly from God that he prophesied about in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And now Jesus, through his shed blood on the cross, has brought an end to the sacrifices of law under the old covenant and has brought complete forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice of himself on the cross where he obtained eternal forgiveness or eternal redemption. And that uh, you can look at in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, and Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. All right. So all this is from God. The old covenant sacrifices passing away, the new covenant coming, a new way of relating to God where we're eternally forgiven through faith in Christ. We have eternal righteousness. We have eternal life through faith in Christ. There's no more continuing to get forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, begging for forgiveness under the law of Moses like David and Daniel and Nehemiah and Moses did. Through faith in Christ, we receive forgiveness of sins. Jesus taught Paul about that in Acts 26, uh, 15 through 18. We see Paul communicating that message in Acts 13, 38 through 39. We see Peter communicating that message in Acts 10, verse 43, that forgiveness is received by faith. Forgiveness was achieved for us at the cross through the blood of Christ, and we receive forgiveness by faith. That's the New Testament of grace. And once we receive forgiveness, we don't keep asking for forgiveness like David did or like Nehemiah did or like Moses did or like Daniel did under the Old Testament of law. We are forgiven once for and for all through the blood of Christ, through his one-time sacrifice, and there's no more forgiveness of sins. We are forgiven. And that's what the writer of Hebrews writes about. He's trying to convince his Jewish audience in AD 65 that they do not have to sacrifice animals anymore for the forgiveness of sins or to be cleansed from sins. That the blood of Christ was sufficient, was effective, was eternal in securing for us eternal forgiveness of sins and eternal life and eternal righteousness. That's why the new covenant or the New Testament in Hebrews 13 is called the eternal covenant. All right. So the old covenant of law has passed away. The new covenant has come. All this is from God. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what does reconcile mean? Well, the word, the word reconcile means to remove an obstacle or a barrier that's, presenting, that's preventing two people from being in relationship. That there's something between two people, this barrier, this obstacle, that is keeping these two people from, from being in relationship. The obstacle or the barrier that kept God from being in relationship with people, a close relationship where he dwelled with us personally, was sin. And we see this under the old covenant of law. God dwelt among the people of Israel in a temple or in a, in a tabernacle. 
but he could not dwell directly with the people of Israel. They had to offer sacrifices for sins. They had to keep getting forgiveness. They had to keep uh, getting cleansed from all their sins. You can read about that in Leviticus. But in this new covenant of grace, God dwells within the believer. Our hearts has, have become his tabernacle. Our hearts have become his temple. The barrier of sin preventing God and humanity from being in relationship has now been removed. And the barrier of sin was taking away and nailed to the cross. We looked at that uh, in actions number one and action number two of this final seven years of the 490 years of, of the 70 weeks of Daniel. So sin has been removed. The barrier of sin has been removed. It's been taken away. It's been nailed to the cross. It's, it's been buried in the ground with Christ. The debt has been paid. Sin has now ceased to be an obstacle or a barrier preventing anybody from being in a relationship with God because Jesus dealt with all sins for all people for all time at one point in history when all of our sins were nailed with Jesus to the cross. That's the ministry of reconciliation that Paul is referring to. Paul says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself or removed the barrier of sin between himself and humanity through Christ, because Jesus took our sin upon himself at the cross. And Paul says, and gave us, that's he and his ministry team, the ministry of reconciliation or, or the task of telling people about the message of reconciliation. And here's what Paul and his ministry team would communicate to people. Here's their, their message. The ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not just Jewish people and not just some people, but he was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting men's trespasses or people's trespasses against them. So everybody in the entire world, their sins were nailed against Christ. From the time Adam sinned until the last sin that's ever committed, all sins have been placed on the cross with Jesus and nailed to the cross. That's why it can say here in the verse that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. Why is God not counting our sins against us? Because all of our sins were counted against Jesus. And if all of our, our sins were counted against Jesus, then how many of our sins are left to be counted against us? None. So there's no sin anybody has committed or will commit that will become a barrier between them and God. Sin cannot block fellowship with God. Sin cannot block a relationship with God. Sin can't prevent anyone from being in relationship with God, nor can sin prevent fellowship with God if somebody is already a believer, because that sin has been nailed to the cross with Christ. God's not counting our sins against us. They were all counted against Christ. Paul goes on to write, and God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And what's the message of reconciliation? That all of our sins were counted against Jesus, meaning there are no more of our sins left that we've committed or will commit that God will count against us. Through faith in Jesus, we receive forgiveness. Acts 26, 15 through 18, Acts 13, 30, uh, 38 and 39, Acts 10, 43. Um, also, you can look in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, uh, Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14, uh, Colossians chapter 2, 13 and 14, uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 12. Our sins have been forgiven. Now, some people may say, well, Matthew chapter 6 says, unless we forgive others, God won't forgive us. It says the same thing in Matthew chapter 18. It's important to understand that both Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 18 are old covenant periods of time. That's why we can't see the New Testament as a set of 27 books, because that's not what the New Testament is. The New Testament is not about 27 books. It's about one Savior's blood. 
And, and our Savior's blood was not shed until Matthew chapter 26, 27. Uh, Luke um, chapter probably 23. So any talk of forgiveness before the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross to establish the New Testament in his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Any talk of forgiveness before that is forgiveness under the law of Moses. Matthew chapter 6, forgiveness under the law. Matthew chapter 28, forgiveness on, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 18, forgiveness under the law. We don't live on the side of the cross before Jesus went to the cross. That's, that's not, we don't live under the law of Moses. We live under the grace of Jesus that was established when he died on the cross. That's what the writer of Hebrews talks about in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. By the grace of our Lord Jesus, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. We receive forgiveness by faith. This is the message that Paul was given by the ascended Jesus to communicate to the world because God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses or their sins against them. And if, and if what Christ did at the cross was for the people of the world, well, somebody's got to go tell the world the good news. And Paul was one of the people who God educated about the new covenant of grace or the new Testament of grace, and then sent him on a missionary journey to communicate this message to the world. So Paul continues, and God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. So Paul and his ministry team were speaking on behalf of Jesus, ambassadors for Christ. That They were speaking the message of the ascended Jesus, because this message did not fully come into um, view uh, people did not fully understand it until Jesus gave the full revelation of what the New Testament really accomplished when he went to the cross. And we see that Jesus spent time, the ascended Jesus spent time with Paul and educated him about the gospel of grace, the new covenant of grace, forgiveness that's received by faith. That's why we see Paul has written most of what's in the Bible following the death of Jesus. So anything that happened after the death of Jesus, Paul writes on that more than anybody. Why? Because the ascended Jesus communicated with Paul and educated Paul about the new covenant of grace, the gospel of God's grace, where forgiveness has been secured for us through Christ, and we receive forgiveness by faith. So when Paul says he's an ambassador of Christ, He's referring back to Acts chapter 26, verses 15 through 18, where Jesus gave him the message of the gospel of grace. You can also look in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, that Jesus, the ascended Jesus, gave Paul the message of the gospel of grace, of taking that message to the world. So when Paul is communicating this gospel, he's speaking on behalf of Jesus because Jesus is in heaven. Paul is on earth, and Paul now is representing Jesus, and he's speaking the message of the gospel of grace. Forgiveness is received by faith. Righteousness is received by faith, not by the works of the law. And he's speaking this message on behalf of Jesus. That's why Paul says, therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. So what's the appeal of God? What is God appealing to the human race about? He's in the context. The appeal is trust in Jesus, faith in Jesus. Leave the old covenant law of Moses to the original audience who still wanted to live under the old covenant of law or mix the old and new together. The appeal is the old has now passed away. The old covenant of law has now passed away. The new covenant of grace has come. So the appeal is in starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, all the way to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the appeal is, is to understand that the law of Moses pointed to the coming of Christ. 
that the law of Moses is a ministry of death, the Ten Commandments is a ministry of death, and the commandments show us our sinfulness, but through the death of Jesus, we receive his righteousness by faith. That's the message of Romans that Paul writes about, his longest letter that he wrote. He explains that one concept, how is a person righteous? Is it through the law of Moses? Is it through the law and grace? Or is it through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross apart from any works or apart from the law? It's by faith in Jesus apart from the law. So God was making his appeal to the human race to receive by faith what Jesus achieved on the cross. And what did Jesus achieve on the cross? He achieved complete forgiveness of sins, and he achieved complete righteousness, just as if someone had never sinned, innocence of sins. And through faith in Jesus, we receive forgiveness, we receive righteousness, and we're eternally forgiven. We're eternally righteous. We're, we're eternally in relationship with God now. That's the purpose of forgiveness and righteousness, is so that we could be in relationship with God, because God wanted to, to, to dwell among us. He actually wanted to dwell within us. He wanted our bodies to become his temple, his sanctuary, his dwelling place. And now he indwells within us. And we now know God as our loving father. The spirit of Christ now dwells within us. And we call God our loving father. Galatians chapter four, verses four through six. So Paul goes on to say, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. And then Paul says, we implore you on behalf of Christ or in light of what Christ did on the cross where all of our sins were counted against him. None of our sins are left to be counted against us. Paul said, we implore you, we urge you, we beg you, as if Christ were begging you, be reconciled to God. Now, God has reconciled us to himself, meaning God has removed the barrier of sin that prevented him from being in relationship with us. But that doesn't mean we are reconciled to God. God has reconciled himself to us doesn't mean we're reconciled to God. How does a person be reconciled to God? How does a person enter into relationship with God? Because there's nothing to prevent a person from being in relationship with God. So what is it that would allow a person to enter into relationship with God? Faith in Jesus. That's the point of Paul's message. Faith in what Jesus did for us we receive forgiveness, we receive righteousness, and then we enter into a relationship with God. We know God personally. That's what the New Testament is about, knowing God, being in relationship with God, where he knows us from the least to the greatest, the heart of God to be in relationship with, with everyone and anyone who comes to faith in Christ. So Paul says, we, my ministry team, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How? Through faith in Christ. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, behalf of the world. He was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. So on our behalf, on the behalf of the entire world, everybody, Jesus became sin for us. He paid our sin debt on the cross. So that in Jesus, or through what Jesus did for us at the cross, we might become, now the word might become here is not a good translation. It's, it's, the, it's, it's one Greek word here, not two. And the Greek word that's translated might become actually means to emerge forth as. That's what the meaning is. So that in Christ, we emerge forth as the righteousness of God. So Jesus went to the cross and took our sinfulness upon himself at the cross. And those who come to faith in Christ, we emerge forth with a new identity. An identity of righteousness. The very righteousness of God. And there's only one righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. We're given the very righteousness of God. 
There's not levels of righteousness. There's not degrees of righteousness. There is only the righteousness of God. And, and Jesus took our sinfulness, 100% of our sinfulness at the cross. And we're given 100% of the righteousness of, of God when we place our faith in Jesus. And that brings us into re relationship with him. That's why we can never be out of fellowship with God. That's why no sin can ever prevent us from being in relationship with God or cause us to be out of fellowship with God. We've emerged forth as the righteousness of God. God has dealt with sin once and for all at the cross. And he's delivered to us now the very righteousness of himself through Jesus. And we receive that righteousness by faith. All right. Well, let's move on to action number four that would happen in the final seven years of the 490 years. And action number four is to bring in everlasting righteousness, which is, which is what action number three is referring to when it talks about reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation is when God has removed the sinfulness of people that would prevent him from being in relationship with them and them from being in relationship with him. God has removed our sinfulness at the cross, and now he's bringing in righteousness. He's removed our sinfulness, and now he's bringing in righteousness. And to the person who places their faith in Jesus, they are made, they emerge forth as righteous, everlasting righteousness. So what we understand in the Jewish scriptures is that we learn that righteousness is required for eternal life. According to the Jewish scriptures, that's Genesis through Malachi. And I don't refer to Genesis through Malachi as the Old Testament because the Old Testament is not about books. It's about the law of Moses. The law of Moses wasn't in effect in, in the book of Genesis. The law of Moses didn't go into effect until Exodus chapter 24, verse 8. And it was in effect until Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, animal sacrifice ceased in the mind of God for the forgiveness of sins, because Jesus was the final sacrifice for sins. So Genesis through Malachi is an Old Testament. It's the Jewish scriptures. The Bible doesn't refer to Genesis through Malachi as the Old Testament. I know it's in the table of contents, but the table of contents is not biblical. It's man-made. It's traditional. It's nothing biblical about it. Um, the New Testament isn't Matthew chapter 1 through Revelation. The New Testament's not 27 books. It's one Savior's blood that went into effect when Jesus died on the cross. The Old Testament of law, people related to God through the law of Moses. You can read about that in Exodus 19 through Leviticus, as well as Deuteronomy. Not a very pleasant way to live. Um, did not produce joy. After the death of Christ, we relate to God through the new covenant, and it produces joy. And you can read about the contrast in the covenants in Hebrews chapter 12. But according to the Jewish scriptures, that's Genesis through Malachi, the righteous ones will experience eternal life, but the sinners, the ungodly, and the wicked will perish in eternal judgment. The foundation for this understanding that the righteous ones will experience eternal life and the sinners, the ungodly, and the wicked will perish in eternal judgment finds its source in Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 through 3, which reads this way. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some, that's the righteous, will awaken to everlasting life. Others, that's the unrighteous, the sinner, the ungodly, the wicked, will awake to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, the word contempt here means a feeling of disgust based upon the decision that one made. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So we could say Paul would be one of the wise here because he's leading people to righteousness when he's telling them that the old covenant of law is a ministry of death, but the new covenant of grace is a ministry of life. It's a ministry of righteousness, where through faith in Jesus, we receive righteousness. So those who trust in Christ are the righteous ones. They will have eternal life. They have eternal life. Those who reject Christ are the unrighteous ones, and they do not have everlasting life. Now, 
the standard for righteousness in the Jewish scriptures is the law of Moses. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 25. We see it in Psalm 119, 7. So the Jewish people understand the law, understood that the law was the standard of righteousness, and the Jewish people understood that to merit eternal life, obedience to the law was required. Deuteronomy 4.8 says, And what nation is great enough to have the righteous statutes and ordinances like this entire law I set before you today? Deuteronomy 6.25. And if we are careful to observe every one of these commandments before the Lord our God, this is Old Covenant Israel under the law, that God has commanded us, the nation of Israel, then that will be our righteousness. Psalm 119.7. I praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. So, based upon the Jewish scriptures, we learn the righteous ones will live forever, and the unrighteous ones will perish in judgment, and the standard for righteousness is the law. We'll read a few more scriptures about the sinner, the ungodly, the wicked, and the righteous. And the righteous have an eternal life, and the wicked, the sinner, the ungodly, perishing in judgment. Look at Psalm 1, 4 through 6. Not so the wicked, for they are like shaft driven off by the wind. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord, the Lord guards the path of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this theme continues throughout the book of Psalms, Psalms 26 or Psalm 26, 9. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. Psalm 28, 3. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak wordly with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Psalm 37, 20. But the wicked will perish. Though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. Psalm 37, 28 through 29. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed. The offspring of the wicked will perish. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Psalm 37, 34. He will exalt you, the righteous ones, who inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. Psalm 37, 38 through 40. But all sinners will be destroyed. There will be no future for the wicked. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Proverbs 11, 4, wealth is worthless on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs eleven nineteen. truly the righteous attain life, but whoever pursues evil finds death. Proverbs eleven twenty two. 22, be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will go free. Proverbs eleven twenty three. 23, the desire of the righteous ends only in good, but in the hope of the wicked, but the hope of the wicked only in wrath. Then Proverbs eleven thirty one. 31, if the, righteousness, if the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? And then in Malachi 3.18, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. So we see in those verses the contrast between righteous ones and wicked ones. The righteous ones will live and the, the wicked ones will die and perish in judgment. Jesus understood this as well. And we see in Matthew 13, 40, uh, 13, 49, Jesus is almost quoting Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. And he says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. It's exactly what Daniel chapter 12, 2 through 3 says. It's exactly what the book of Psalms says about the wicked and the righteous and Malachi. So the Jewish scriptures and Jesus are very clear that the righteous ones will enjoy eternal life, where the unrighteous ones, the sinners, the ungodly, the wicked, will experience eternal judgment. Now, Jesus understood the mindset of the Jewish people. Their mindset was, if, if we're going to have eternal life and not undergo judgment, we have to be righteous. And the Jewish people understood that righteousness, that the standard for righteousness was the law. And since the standard of righteousness is the law and, law and righteousness has to be obtained to avoid judgment, 
then obedience to the law is required for one to become righteous. So Jesus understood that the mindset of the Jewish people a righteousness by the works of the law. But Jesus also understood that the law could not bring righteousness, but it could reveal sin. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 6, Jesus tries to convince his Jewish audience that they failed to meet the righteous standards of the law. He says, if you've had lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. If you've had murder in your heart, or if you've had anger in your heart, you've committed murder. He's using the law to show people that they are sinners, that they cannot become righteous through the law, but it's through the law that they see that they're unrighteous. Because ultimately, he's leading them to faith in him, to belief in him for righteousness. Now, many times Jesus used the law to reveal the sinfulness of people so they would believe in him for righteousness. Such with the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus uses the two great commandments to reveal to the expert in the law that he is a sinner. In the story of the rich young ruler, Jesus used the law to show the rich young ruler that he was a sinner. Jesus wasn't saying in the story of the Good Samaritan to go obey the two great commandments so that you can be righteous. He was showing the, the, the expert in the law that I know you think righteousness is is based upon the two, two great commandments. But the fact that you hate the Samaritan has proven that you've broken the first two commandments. Therefore, the law has convinced you and convicted you of being a sinner. And the same with the story of the rich young ruler uh, who wanted to obey the commandments uh, to become righteous before God so he could have eternal life. And Jesus shows him that he's broken the law because he... he He's, he's devoted to money more than he is to God. He's broken the commandments. He's, he's, he's coveting. He, he's, his, his God is money. And by doing that, he's broken the law. And even though he had tried to obey the law since he was a child, he had actually broken the law, leaving the disciples in the story of the rich young ruler saying, well, if this guy can't be saved, who's tried to obey the law his entire life, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, what's impossible with man, righteousness through obedience to the law, is possible with God because God offers in Christ righteousness for free as a gift. Jesus took upon himself our sinfulness at the cross. We're given the very righteousness of God through faith in Christ. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Peter and Paul for a moment as it relates to, to, to the old covenant of law and the new covenant of grace. Peter was having trouble with the concept of old covenant of law, new covenant of grace. And that's no surprise. Most people do today. Whenever um, I teach about the New Testament of grace in contrast to the Old Testament of law, when I teach that the Old Testament is not 39 books and the New Testament is not 27 books, people have a really difficult time with that. Um, ultimately, they see it. Most see it. They understand it uh, as they dig into the scriptures. Peter was having a, a difficult time with it as well. Peter had been given the revelation of the New Testament of grace in Acts chapter 10. Jesus told him the New Testament was going to be established in his blood in Matthew 26 and Luke 22, Luke 20, 22. And then he still continues to have trouble with it. And he has a vision in Acts chapter 10 to confirm this New Testament of grace. And then what we see is in Galatians chapter 2, Peter has abandoned the the New Testament of grace as the means for righteousness, the, the, the blood of Christ as the means of righteousness. And he's gone back to the law of Moses and obedience to the law as the means of righteousness. Well, in Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 11, Paul confronts Peter. And he ends this confrontation where really it starts when, in verse 14 of Galatians 2 and ends with Galatians 2.21. But the, he, Paul sets it up in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. And so he's confronting Peter, telling him that righteousness does not come by obedience to the law of Moses. Righteousness comes through faith in Jesus. So in Galatians 2.21, Paul tells Peter this. He said, Peter, I do not set aside the grace of God like you have, Peter. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. 
Boy, it doesn't get much simpler than that. If a person could obtain righteousness through the law of Moses, through any system of works, through any effort of their own, through any moral obedience or moral standard, through any commitment or devotion to any type of religious system, if somebody in and of themselves could, could gain the righteousness needed for eternal life, then Christ died for nothing. And what Paul is saying is, it's obvious, Peter, that righteousness can't be gained through the law. Because if it could be gained through the law, Peter, then why did Christ die? And Paul's saying that because Jesus died on the cross, it's proof that no one can merit righteousness. So he's trying to move Peter away from obedience to the law for righteousness back to faith in Jesus for righteousness. It's not that Peter had lost his salvation because he was a believer in Christ, but his, he had got confused on his doctrine. He had got confused on his theology because of the men sent from James who then came to seek to persuade Peter to move back to the law of Moses for righteousness rather than faith in Jesus for righteousness. And Paul lays it all out in Galatians chapter 2. Now, the reason he does that is because the Galatians were making the same mistake that Peter made. They were under the influence of law-based teachers. Uh, Peter was under the influence of James and the men James sent. And now the Galatians were under very law-based, works-based, for righteousness teachers. And they now had deserted the grace of the Lord Jesus, the new covenant for righteousness, and they, like Peter, had gone back to the law. And so that's why Peter, uh, that's why Paul tells the story in Galatians chapter 2. He said, hey, Galatians, you're not the only ones who've done this. So did Peter. Peter was bewitched. Peter was tricked by the men that James sent. I know who bewitched Peter. I know who tricked Peter. But he opens up Galatians chapter 3 and he says, but who tricked you? Who bewitched you? Who told you that righteousness is through obedience to the law of Moses and not through faith in Jesus? That goes against the entire gospel message. They had received the gospel message in Acts 13 when Paul went to Pisidian Antioch to share the gospel. But after receiving the gospel, they rejected the gospel. They still believed in Christ, but they rejected the gospel that righteousness is by faith in Jesus apart from the law. Forgiveness is received by faith in Jesus apart from the law. And then Paul makes this statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. He says, For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. See, the law cannot make anybody righteous. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the law is a ministry of death. Why? Because it points out our unrighteousness. And it, it sentences people to death. Galatians chap, or Romans chapter 3 says the law convinces everybody that they're a sinner. The law convicts everybody they're, that they're a sinner, Jew or Gentile. Uh, the Jews had the law written on stone. Uh, Romans chapter 2, uh, the, the, the Gentiles had the law written on our hearts. We know right from wrong. We know good from evil. That's the tree of knowledge that, that is represented in, Galatia, or in Genesis. The tree of knowledge, sin has come through Adam and Eve, uh, Romans chapter 5, to the entire world. We understand right from wrong. We understand. We have the knowledge of good and evil. And, and obedience to the law can't make anybody righteous. What the law does is it shows everybody we're unrighteous. We're the sinners of the book of Psalms. We're the, we're the wicked of the book of Psalms. We're the sinners of the book of Proverbs. We're the wicked of the book of Proverbs. We're the ungodly ones apart from Christ. So how does a person become righteous so that we can have eternal life? Because only the righteous will inherit eternal life. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. Well, look at Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Here's the good news. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul teaches on the same thing in Romans chapter 4. Understand then that those who have faith 
are children of Abraham, meaning that faith is how a person becomes righteous. How did Abraham become righteous? By believing God. And God said, I'm going to credit righteousness to you. Paul goes on the right in Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. That's Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 18, 18, and Genesis 22, 18. The blessing that would come through Abraham is righteousness by faith. And Jesus is, is the one who took our sinfulness, and now we receive the very righteousness of God through Christ by faith. Faith. Paul writes about that too in Galatians 3. So those who rely on faith, not the works of the law, not devotion, not commitment, but faith in Jesus are blessed with Abraham. And what's that blessing? You are righteous. We're blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Look at Romans 3, 19 through 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now, Romans chapter 2 the Jews were under the law because it was written on stone. Romans chapter 2, the Gentiles were under the law because it was written on our hearts. We understand right from wrong. We understand good from evil, whether it's written on stone or not. So Paul's referring to the entire human race here in Romans 3, 19 through, through, uh, through 20. But we're going to read through 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world, that's everybody in the entire world, may be held accountable to God. For what? For breaking the law. The law is written on stone for the Jews, written on the hearts of Gentiles. And everybody has broken the law. We're accountable to God for breaking the law. And what do we say to a God who knows everything? Nothing. We're silent because God knows our heart. He knows our actions. He knows our attitudes. What do we say to God? Oh, I'm righteous, God. Well, we know that's a lie. Apart from Christ, we have no righteousness. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. All are unrighteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, in Romans 3, uh, 23, we're about to read here, all have sinned. So he says, no one is declared righteous before God by the works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin or the awareness of sin or the understanding that we're sinners. It's how Jesus used the law in uh, Matthew 5 through 6. It's how he used the law with the rich young ruler. It's how he used the law with the Good Samaritan or with the expert in the law when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. Through the law comes the awareness that we're sinners. But now apart from the law, so through the law, we become aware, that, aware of our sinfulness. But a, apart from the law, we become righteous. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God that Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21, this righteousness of God. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, which is attested by the law and the prophets, has been disclosed, has been made known, namely the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believed. What Paul is saying here, it's not one's faithfulness to the law that makes them righteous. It's the faithfulness of Jesus who went to the cross because he loved us. And at the cross, he took our sin upon himself. And through faith in Jesus, through belief in Jesus, we receive righteousness. That's what Paul writes about in Romans 4 and Galatians 3. For there is, um, through the righteousness of God, the faithfulness of Jesus, or the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, Jews and Gentiles, everybody has sinned and fall short of the glory of God, fall short of righteousness but are justified or declared righteous by God freely by his grace. That's what Christ did for us on the cross through the redemption or through the payment for our sins. That is in Christ Jesus. It's belief is how a person is righteous. Whether it was Abraham believing in Genesis 15 
or whether it was a person believing in Jesus when he walked the earth before he died on the cross. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one, one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, where? In judgment, but have eternal life. He's referring back to uh, Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. He does it a lot in the book of John. How does a person obtain the righteousness needed to enjoy eternal life and to escape judgment? It's the same for Abraham, belief. It's the same for us, belief. It's the same for those who lived during the time of Jesus, belief. Through belief, we are declared righteous. So we're looking at the six actions that take place during the final seven years of the 490-year period. Action number four was to bring in everlasting righteousness. This righteousness is received through faith in Jesus. Real quick, let's look at action number five, to seal up vision and prophecy. This means there would be no more visions and prophecies given to Israel after the anointed one came in Acts 29, 24 through 27. Once the anointed one came, once Jesus came, visions and prophets uh, given to Israel about um, future events, uh, would be no more uh, for the nation of Israel. There would be no more visions given to prophets in Israel about Israel. The role of prophets would come to a close under the law of Moses. The anointed one is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. Jesus would be the final revelation to Israel. And once Jesus was presented to Israel as the Christ, prophecy was sealed up for the nation of Israel. That's the 490 years. That's the end of prophecy when the Messiah would come. So God no longer then, after the Messiah came, would speak through prophets because God was going to speak directly to the nation of Israel through Jesus. And that's what it means by to seal up vision and prophecy. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the past, that's prior to the arrival of Jesus as the Christ. You can see the arrival of Jesus in John chapter 1, 29 through 34. So in the past, God spoke to our, that's the Jewish people in AD 65. And when Jesus was living and after he died. In the past, God spoke to our, that's the Jewish people, our ancestors, that's the Jewish people in the Jewish scriptures prior to the arrival of Jesus as the Christ. God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. That's Isaiah through Malachi and, and other prophets, such as Elijah and Elijah. At many times and in various ways. But in these last days of the Old Covenant Testament of Israel, of the 490 years, in these last days, God has spoken to us, the Jewish people, by his son. All right, that's, that's what part of the 70 weeks are about, the coming of the anointed one. And when the anointed one came, then vision and prophecy would be sealed up because the prophecies are pointing to Jesus. The visions are all pointing to Jesus. There would be no more need for prophecies and visions because they talk about Jesus. That's what they're about. Now he's come. And now God begins speaking to the nation of Israel through the person of Jesus. And we can see that take place in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, in the book of Luke. We also see that Jesus is speaking to the nation of Israel during this time through the blood of Jesus. We see that in Hebrews chapter 12, where through the blood of Jesus, the new covenant of grace has been established. And in Hebrews, God is no longer relating to the people of Israel via the law of Moses, but through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the grace of the Lord Jesus, this New Testament of grace, was established when Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins. So, let's finish this verse. Um, God has spoken to us, the people of Israel, by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through all, whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 
After Jesus had provided purification for sins, that's actions number one through actions number four of the final seven years, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So, in the past two studies, we've examined actions one through five of the 70 weeks of Daniel of the 490 years. We've looked at the final seven years where really the actions of action number one through action number four took place. All about Jesus establishing the new covenant in his blood, securing eternal forgiveness and eternal righteousness and eternal life. So we've looked at action number one, finished disobedience, finished transgressions. We looked at two perspectives on that last week. We've looked at action number two, make or put an end to sins. We've looked at action number three, make reconciliation for iniquity. We've looked at action number four, bring in everlasting righteousness. We've looked at action number five, seal up vision and prophecy. So in our next study, we're going to examine action number six, which is the anointing of the most holy.